Renewed fighting in northern Mali between the military and armed groups. The UN is speeding up the withdrawal of its peacekeepers as the security situation deteriorates. Can Mali win its battle for stability? And how do foreign players shape the conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. The UN peacekeeping mission in Mali says the deteriorating security situation is forcing it to speed up its withdrawal from the country. A week ago, six UN troops and dozens of fighters from an armed group were killed in confrontations near the northern city of Bear. The UN is already in the process of wrapping up its operations. In June, the Security Council voted to terminate the decade-long mission announcing the 13,000 peacekeepers would leave Mali by the end of the year. It followed a request from the military government, which accused the UN of failing to act against armed groups. There is a diverse range of players adding to the instability in Mali. So who are the different groups and what areas do they control? Well, first, there's the coordination of Azawad movements, or CMA, which is a coalition of mostly Tuareg groups. They're advocating for greater autonomy and independence for a region of northern Mali known as Azawad. The Tuaregs have a history of grievances with the military-led government, which took power three years ago. It's a network of alliances and foreign support. Strained relations with former colonial power France led the junta to seek alternative backing, which includes mercenaries from Russia's Wagner Group. Along with the pro-government fighters, a number of other armed groups operate in Mali. Some of them are aligned with ISIL and Al-Qaeda. And the complexities on the ground have hampered efforts to stabilise Mali set out in a 2015 peace deal. Before we discuss the various elements at play with our guests, let's watch this report from Karaleg. Packing their bags and heading home, the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali is coming to an end. Launched a decade ago, the operation became the UN's most dangerous. The so-called Blue Helmets deployed to help the military fight armed groups in the north. But in June, after growing public dissent and what the foreign minister described as a crisis of confidence, the military government asked the UN to withdraw its 13,000 peacekeepers. The UN Security Council voted unanimously to draw down the force by the end of the year. Please raise their hand. Despite government accusations of UN interference and counter-accusations of widespread abuses by soldiers, the head of the mission called it a success. The mission did a very good job. Of course it's not perfect, but we worked with devotion, sincerity and courage, and we paid a high cost. 300 of my colleagues have lost their lives and 700 were injured serving Mali, so we feel we have done a lot. But Mali's military government disagrees and believes the country is better off without the UN. It's already sought help from Russia's Wagner Group. Human rights organizations accuse the mercenaries of war crimes and there are fears that without the peacekeepers, things will only get worse. The Malian state and the Malian army will try to take over those UN positions, which appears to make sense, but given the context and the stalling peace process, their presence may increase existing tension. A year ago, French troops ended an eight-year deployment after a breakdown in relations between Mali and its former colonial power. In the subsequent months, armed groups have intensified their attacks and extended their reach. Coups in neighboring Burkina Faso and Niger have added to regional instability, and so far, the West African bloc has failed to make good on its threats to intervene and restore order by force. With several parties now fighting to gain ground left behind by the UN, it's the people of Mali who remain caught in the middle. Kara Leg for Inside Story. All right, let's try and unravel the complexities of all this. Joining me now are our guests in Bamako. We have Musa Kondo, who's a former special advisor to the president of Mali. He's now executive director of the Sahel Institute for Democracy and Governance. In Ankara is Ovigwe Agwegu, a security analyst uh, focusing on West Africa and the Sahel for AfriPolitica, a security consultancy. 
Uh, also in Bamako is Fatima Al Ansar, political and security analyst spe specializing in the Sahel and founder of the Tawate Peace Network in Timbuktu. A warm welcome to all of you. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Musa, if I could start with you, sir, if I may. Um, first up, why does the Malian government think the UN force is surplus to requirements? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me here, and hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, we have to think about the position and also the role of the UN mission in Mali since uh, the arrival and also the improvement of the situation in the field. And recently, after the military coup in uh, uh, 2020 and the second in uh, May 2021, we've seen uh, another direction taken by the, the authorities of the transition, and especially in the military actions in the field. So taking over the control of everything as the sovereignty, as they mentioned, is a part of uh, uh, conquering or reconquering all this territory uh, until now occupied by the former rebel groups who are considered now as the signing uh, groups of the peace agreement in Algeria. So this much more part of uh, uh, the reconquer and the, uh, as they said, the monte, uh, the power of the, the, the national army. So at this moment or not, we're expecting the end of the, the UN mission in Mali uh, in this, uh, among this situation. Right. Well, it's about to happen. Isn't it? Fatima al Ansa, at August 2022, the French, the last French troops pull out of Mali. August 2023, a year later, UN peacekeepers are packing up. Is it not inevitable, Fatima, uh, that violence would and will continue to spiral? Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your questions. I think uh, it will depend. Uh, it will depend how will the handover of different bases, but because right now there is 13 uh, UN uh, peacekeeping bases in the different region of Mali. I think the way they will do the handover to the Malian government will depend on how uh, violent uh, the, the process will be now or even later. I think, first of all, it's very important that the, press, the process of the handover of the different bases is very inclusive. Uh, when I mean inclusive, I mean having like a very intense discussion with the UN uh, mission and then the Malian government. At the same time, also have a consultation with the armed groups because the armed groups, are like their bases, there are like three main sensitive bases, like uh, Kidal, Tassalit and Algarlog. Those are the three sensitive bases that the armed group really feel like they own those places. And I think like if we do like a very aggressive handover without really having like a formal consultation with the armed group, it might be a violent uh, handover and it will not be good for the, civil, for the civilians. So I think before we go to like the next handover, which is Kidal, it will be happening in September. I think it will be very important for the Malian army, uh, the Malian government, to actually sit down with the arm, to the arm group SEMA and uh, the permanent, the permanent framework uh, group to see how they can really talk and see how they can have the agreement before the Minisma hand over those bases. So I think that's okay. my only worry. Thanks, Fatima. Uh, so Obigwe, uh, first of all, do you think such a sit down conversation? Uh, between the, the military leadership and armed groups is likely. Uh, and secondly, how serious do you think the situation is? Yeah, it's a very serious situation in the sense that uh, we do have MINUSMA raise a lot of questions. But however, with regards specifically to the hand handover, yes, uh, there's a lot that has happened since all, uh, the OGAS process that led to the 2015 agreement. There with a lot of consultation also that led to that led to the new constitution. So I think the government does have access and uh, some form of legitimacy in the eyes of uh, out of this this rebel rebels. So it can't it can't discuss the circumstances with the rebels and ensure that the, the handover is smooth. Okay, uh, but when the UN pull out, who will take their place? And certainly, who will take their place in in their barracks and so forth, their positions? Yeah, I mean that, that that is the big question, and it's not just it's not just even about Mali now. Also, Burkina, Burkina Faso as well. With these withdrawals and mm. knowing the size of the of the armies, it is a it's a huge challenge. 
you know, uh, I mean, MINUSMA was about 17,000 17, strong. That is a lot of forces. Mind you, before MINUSMA's withdrawal, there was the, the closure or the drawdown of French troops under Operation Bakan, which was about 5,000. So in, within one year, we're looking at, we're looking at over 22,000 in, uh, uh, soldiers being removed from the, from the battlefield between between uh, Mali and, and neighboring countries. That's a huge gap, and I think uh, Mali at this moment is leaning more towards Russia. Uh, getting is getting weapons from Russia these days is also employing the, the services of, of Wagner. However, there is no way Russia can or Wagner can provide that amount of forces to block the, the gaps. It has to recruit more from within the population. To, to, you know, to make up for, for this uh, short fault. Right, and we'll get on to Wagner in just a second. But, Musa, I just wanted to ask you before that, uh, you know, th this is the point, isn't it? This vacuum that's going to be left by the UN, it's, it's several thousand forces. Uh, who will now act as mediator once they've gone? Yeah, so I, I just want to come back quick uh, on the point you just mentioned, because uh, sure. the, 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 the United Nations is about 17,000 people, but more than 60% of this a amount of people were not engaging in the field as military. They had a lot of other uh, agenda and working very different uh, areas as development and uh, as community uh, support, sustainability development programs. So that make uh, even the government of Mali thinking government, uh, the, the United Nations mission is doing things which would not ask them to do. This is one thing. The second thing also about the handover the barracks, MINUSMA, uh, the UN mission occupied in Mali, it has been clear they should give this back to the government of Mali. Whatever happens, even though they think is not the right way, but when you take the peace agreement in, of Algeria in 2015, all the signing group recognize the sovereignty and the independence of Mali. So this is one point. So if they going back, even though this, when the agreement was signing, every position kept their position. So that made the armed group, uh, the former rebels group, occupy Kidal and other places in the northern region. So that made them like the responsible of these areas. But when the mission is 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 a withdrawing, so of, of obviously they give back the barracks to the government. So whatever the, that's, that's the, the, the armed groups are not going to accept that, are they? They just won't accept that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why they say we should have like an internal conversation between Malians to sit down and also recently a communique from uh, the, the, the groups from Kidal mentioned that they should have a new conversation between Malian to sit down and say what should be the next step because the insecurity and the problem is even not more in the northern regions is much more based in the central area where we have more killings daily basis than the northern region. So that means the, the, the pressure, that means the, 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 the arrangement of, uh, of the fight, of the struggle, of the, the conflict is, is, is not even based 100% in the northern region, but now how to think large and think big, including everyone in this conversation. So we have a peace OK, uh, let me bring in Fatima at that point. Uh, so if, if there are these discussions and negotiations, uh, both sides have to bring something to the table. And, and if uh, the government say that they want to take over the, the old UN positions, what are the armed groups going to get in return? Uh, what, what's their side of the bargain? Yeah, I think that's why I mentioned earlier that sitting down, because right now there is no dialogue between the, between the armed groups and the government. And I think if they sit down and actually talk, they can find they can come out with a common agreement. But you say For they instance, can find a way, but it's easy, it's easy to say that. Forgive me, it's easy to say that, isn't it? But what, yeah, what would, what would back, they get in return? I'm coming back, yeah, I'm coming back to the point. A uh, okay. few few weeks ago, there was a, a communique on social media saying uh, like one of the demands of the armed groups, the armed groups were demanding three things to open a dialogue. They were asking for re the release of some of the prisoners. And and Mali, the Malian government have did release some of the prisoners. The, the 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 director of the state security even went to Kidal, discussed with the armed group, and they have released some of the prisoners. And the second request the was changing the minister of reconciliation, which is like a very sensitive demand. And the third one was uh, actually they, they since they have rejected the constitution, so they wanted the government to actually cancel it 
or even see how they can uh, open that. And I think those two demands were like where the government like are very skeptical. And I think if they can find a way to sit down and see how they can find a common agreement on those two demands, I think they can uh, uh, come up with a solution. And I don't think the solution will be coming from like an international mediation or anything like that because it didn't work. It's happened before Algeria peace uh, peace agreement, Algeria being like the host, haven't been like like very efficient in in bringing like the dialogue between the government because the dialogue have been cut off. It's been months now that they don't really talk. So I think that it's right. very important, as Musa said, to have like an actual internal conversation. The government need to take the initiative and the armed group to actually sit down and talk okay. and see how they can back to the table. That's the okay. solution. So, Ovigwe, right? Ov Ov what do you make of that? Uh, you know, the fact that we could turn this round and just say, out of this, this pullout, uh, there is an opportunity. There's an opportunity for discussion, uh, a, a chance for, you know, a chance to seek resolution. Uh, is it likely? Is it possible, do you think? Yes, I think it's possible. And I, and I like the fact that the previous speaker itemized the three requests that, that the armed groups are, are making. One, 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 one who really understands how this process is really goes knows that it, the government really at this point has to make concessions because you, you, you really are in a very difficult position regarding the the withdrawal of such huge amount of you know fighting power and the, and you don't really have necessarily have the, the manpower to to block the, the gap. So at this point, it has to really favor dialogue and if you are going to make that if you are going to go through dialogue then you have to make concession so for instance the, the second point about, about the minister recon, reconciliation again that is very sensitive like previous speaker said but maybe you you should because the alternative is going to be very devastating and i think that that's a point that cannot be stressed enough fatima as if the situation is not complex enough now we bring in the Wagner mercenaries. What is their mandate and what do you think their presence on the ground does to the whole situation? I mean, uh, the Wagner, uh, the Malian, first of all, the Malian government have never recognized, have, have never accepted that there is Wagner. They always say there is risk, there is uh, instruction, risk instruction in, uh, under the ground. And I think the mission of the, those uh, Russian military under the ground are different from the mission that the UN was doing. The UN really was working on community-based dialogue with different community development work, like ha having a humanitarian access in places that the Malian government cannot have access to. And I don't think that the Russian military will be able to help Mali on that. And that's not even the mission. They are not there for that. So I think right now is a way, it's like for the Malian government to come out with a strategy on how to actually fill up the gap, the humanitarian gap. Like for instance, the attack that happened in Bear, having like a, a, a very quick uh, uh, impact response uh, from the government to actually help those like communities to have access to uh, humanitarian help. And I think uh, a few weeks ago, the Malian government have, have launched like uh, a fund, which is like a 500 million fund to help like community like uh, Kidal, Menaka, uh, uh, Buguni, uh, with like community-based programs so that organizations that are working on humanitarian, they can give them funding so that they can actually do community-based uh, yeah, programs. How does, that, how does that fit in with the, the Wagner mercenaries? You know, back to my question, how are they helping the situation? That's what I'm saying. The mission are not the same. The, military, the, the Russian military are there for military uh, 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 operations, so they are not there to help with the humanitarian parts. So that's the Malian government responsibility to 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 work okay. on that. Okay, uh, Musa, what what's your view of the the Wagner uh, position here? Because it said that civilian casualties have more than tripled since Wagner forces were deployed to Mali uh, in late 2021. So how are they helping in any way the peace equation? Uh, first of all, as uh, my colleague said, officially the government said there is no Wagner. So even though the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia said Wagner is in Mali, I would say I will go with the Russian instructor. So telling you exactly the situation in the field is getting really poor. Poor in that sense, 
first of all, they're not bringing any humanitarian support because they're not here for that. And secondly, they are doing a lot of human rights abuse. And mm -hmm. we have heard this from a lot of victims directly from the field. Uh, I have personally not been there to, uh, to, to double check or verify, but we received the same way as uh, international report uh, based on fact. So I would not comment even this, but the way people are moving from their places and the way pe uh, people are leaving their own villages because of attacks and because of uh, human rights abuse from uh, uh, the partners of the national army, these are things we can base it on, say, they, this Russian and structure groups are not bringing any kind of support to the peace we're building right now and also going to feature, because I deeply believe even the way we build peace depends on how we do the conflict. So the way things are happening, it, have, it will be really hard for a, a cohesion and living together in the same areas where these guys are, 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 are acting. The thing is, uh, Musa, the way we do the conflict, as you put it, it's not being done in a good fashion in any way, is it? Because according to US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, many of those deaths that I talked about were the result of operations conducted by Malian armed forces alongside members of the Wagner Group. Yeah, definitely, because at the end of the conflict, uh, Mopti will not move to Burkina or Menaka will not move to, to, uh, to, to Niger. They all these cities will remain the same cities with the same people. So if there is a like legal, I mean, the war situation, everyone can fight each other. But if the atrocity or a kind of uh, human rights abuse reach a point, it will be really hard for people to understand and even forgive for to build a really strong and lasting peace. Mm -hmm. That's why I say the way we do conflict, because conflict is not like at the end of the day, some Malians will be no Malian and again. The, the difference of this conflict is not, we're not fighting another nation. The conflict is happening between brothers, between sisters, and whatever the misunderstanding could get, however the conflict gets, it's very important to keep this in mind. Like after the conflict, after the peace, however we will get it, we will be living together as the yeah. families, as brothers, as sisters. Okay, let's broaden it out a little bit. Uh, Ovigwe, what are the dangers of this uh, combusting regionally, given the, the deeply, deeply unsettling nature of things right now in Niger and elsewhere? Yes, I, I think it's, it's very crucial that the Malian government does not lose grip of things uh, as we are seeing this this massive drawdown of, of troops, uh, of uh, MINUSMA in particular. And that is because uh, one of the hotbeds of uh, terrorists and jihadi groups in the Sahel is a part called Tilaberi region, which is a tri-border area between Mali, Burkina Faso, and, and Niger. And right now, relationship between Mali and Burkina Faso is very good. If the junta in, in Niger takes a, a, a consolidates power, they, of course, are, because of the support that Mali and Burkina Faso are providing, might, they, might, they might be very enthusiastic towards forming some form of uh, multinational joint tax force, because the, these threats that they face are, are transna transnational, so that the solutions have to be transnational. The issue of secessionism and separatism in Mali is, 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 a, is a local issue in a, sen in a sense, but in addition to that is the issue of terrorists as well who are operating in, in the in, in the country so mali cannot necessarily lose grip of both things it has to find a way to ensure that both the diplom uh, political processes within mali within all of these uh, disgruntled groups is it is well handled but at the same time it has the military capacity abuse military capacity within mali and also extend our military cooperation with regional countries, particularly Burkina Faso and Niger, to ensure that they continue to clamp down on these terrorist groups, particularly in that Tilaber region. Because if they don't, then the situation as it is today would be, you know, minuscule compared to what it can be in the coming years. Yes, and that's very troubling, isn't it? Fatima, it, it's a complex web of interests and alliances in Mali and in the region, to say the least. And to add to that, Mali itself has had a military government since 2020. The leadership has vowed to restore a civilian 
governments. Do you think we're on course for that to happen? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we we uh, we we have done the the, the the first hardest thing, which is organizing like the referendum. Now the Malian government have a new constitution, and they, a few weeks ago they had a meeting with all the uh, political actors to discuss on the deadline of when they should be organizing the election. I think out of like the participant. 14 were like out of like the uh, political party who took part of the meeting for 15 percent or 15 of them were like we can like postpone the organization of the election which was supposed to be in march to another date or uh, 14 percent were like no we have to organize the election in march so i think right now there's a discussion on like actually finalizing the date of organizing the election uh, I think that the Malian government, looking at like the different steps that they are going forward, I think there is a chance that they might actually organize the election and give power uh, to like a civilian uh, actor. All right, we'll see how it all pans out. Uh, do appreciate all your perspectives. Thanks very much to our guests, Musa Kondo, Ovigwe Aguegu, and Fatima Alansa. Thank you so very much indeed. And thank you too for watching. Uh, you can see the program again at any time by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark. And the whole team here in Doha, it's goodbye for now.